I mean, at least it was my understanding as a kid、um, as for what an eldest sister should be doing. Like, I should always have the answer. I should always know what to do.、Um, that's the kind of expectation or pressure that I subjected myself to growing up as that, well. That that's true. That's true.、So、yeah. I, I, I totally agree because it's also a double-edged sword. It kind of becomes like a trauma that、yeah. you have to unlearn, and you have to tell yourself that it's okay if you if you don't know what you're doing. It's okay、exactly. that you don't. You can figure it out. Welcome to Proudly Asian. A podcast series that tells bold and proud stories of Asians by Asians. My name is Isabel, your podcast host, and I'm here to find stories that challenge biases we face every day. There's never just one way to look at Asians. This podcast will take you through a deep dive into the life stories, struggles, and triumphs of young Asians around the world. On today's episode, we have Mara Munoz, a Filipino marketing professional based in Manila. As the eldest among three siblings, Mara is known to be the guinea pig of the family, and so far she's still breathing. She chats with us about the good and the bad of being a firstborn child, and what firstborn children want the world to know. Welcome back to Proudly Asian. Now, this week we are dedicating this episode to all our listeners who are fellow firstborns. Whether you're Asian or not, we know that adulting is hard, and adulting while being the firstborn child of your family sucks. So, for this episode, let's gather around firstborn children. We're gonna chat about the good and the bad about being the firstborn, and how we are going to take care of ourselves. Physically, mentally, or whatever. But without further ado, I'm gonna bring in a fellow firstborn to join us on this conversation. And this episode, we have Mara. Welcome to Proudly Asian, Mara. How are you? Hey, hey, hey. Good. <laughs> no pressure, Mara. I know of all the firstborns that I personally know. I think you are probably one of the like role model <laughs> firstborns、oh. that I've come across. <laughs> Having seen you in action, your organizational skills, your planning skills for family trips—it just makes me feel like I am the firstborn who gave up, and then you are the one who's actually showing all the firstborns around the world like how to get things done. So this is why I had to bring you on this episode. <laughs> We try to do our best, cause no one's gonna do it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm trying. I'm also trying. But now,、um, before we get into the actual conversation about being firstborns, right? For our listeners、mm-hmm. to get to know more about you, why don't we start with the very basic questions that we ask every single guest on Proudly Asian, which is tell us about your background. Who are you? What are you? And where did you grow up? Okay. So, hi guys. My name is Mara. Well. Technically, it's Margaret, <laughs> but it's so long. So yeah, I'm known for Mara, and、um, I'm the firstborn. So we're three, and I'm from the Philippines. All the juicy bits, maybe we can talk about it later. <laughs> for what is worth, you're just listening to two firstborn children of the families、mm-hmm. talking during this episode. So hopefully, it's going to be one that's fun, maybe emotional, because.、Um, We haven't really done this topic、um, on proudly Asian, but then it's been on my mind. And I think whenever I was kind of trying to find a guest to talk about this topic, I think you are always appearing to be the first choice. And I'm so glad that I asked you to join us on this episode. Now, obviously,、um, we are both firstborns here, and、um, let's just chat about all aspects about being a firstborn child. So, one of the popular、mm-hmm. sayings. About firstborn children is that firstborn children are the unpaid interns. Do you have any opinions about this? Like, do you agree with this? One hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> like, 
it brings me it's it brings back so much memories how in a way i grew up faster than the usual because i'm asked to do things that a younger girl don't normally do i guess that's how you put it because my dad um he's always not around so it's just well there's there's my mom but my mom is working so that leaves me with the rest of my siblings right and then i'd always be the one who's in charge but my parents would ask me to be like hey mara you have to remember to do this and that so these are the chores or maybe the responsibilities and you have that checklist you have to make sure that everyone does it or else of course you're gonna get in trouble and in a way it's like hmm i'm not supposed to be handling money at the age of seven I'm not wow. supposed to be paying for my tuition fee and my sister's tuition fee. But for some reason, I do remember that. I was the one paying for our tuition fee. So, and that's, that's like thousands of pesos. Wow. Wow. I I mean, whenever I see this statement, firstborn children being the unpaid interns, it will be like, well, firstborn children are the unpaid interns, but their parents are also the inexperienced managers. I don't know whatever that's called, but then that whole dynamics, right? If it's um, interns, then that makes the, the parents their managers, right? So I just feel like there are a lot of trial and errors um, that were done mm-hmm. on firstborn children because um, for most of the parents, obviously dealing with their firstborn children is really their first time dealing with mm-hmm. Um, their own children right so um, no one is born an expert of parenting so um, it's only fair to assume that for parents it's also their first time dealing with a baby you know watching the person grow and there's like oh my god I have to figure out schooling for them now oh my god I have to figure out um, universities and all so it's just like learning process a lot of learning on the parents yeah. part as well right so so true i would always joke around here at home i would call myself the guinea pig and then <laughs> yeah you like for real and i would tell them oh okay so mara didn't die so that's probably parenting done right so if she's not dead then whatever we did can be applied to the next one can be applied to my sister or my brother so if something's wrong with her, then maybe we shouldn't do the shouldn't do the same thing to the next one. And then they were just laughing because everything's a trial for me, right? So even the schools, right? The schools, the I remember back then even the way of um doing public transportation. So if if Mara was able to survive this, then we think that my sister and my brother would be able to survive this as well. So in a way, yeah. Yeah, so growing up as a kid, did you know that? Did you already feel like a guinea pig as a seven-year-old? Not really, because you don't know, right? It's like, Mm. it's your normal. So whenever my mom would ask me to do certain things, so I'm just really following. And Mm -hmm. in my mind, I just don't want to get in trouble. Mm. But at the same time, it's like you see that, all around you all the firstborns so here in the philippines we call the older sisters ate Mm. and then the older brothers or anyone older than you uh, a male person that's older than you is kuya so as an ate or a kuya you're kind of it's a given to be the responsible one you don't just hear it from your parents you also hear that from everyone else from your aunties from your uncles even from school right that that as an ate you have to be the responsible one so at a young age that's kind of instilled that you have to be like this you have to give way to the younger siblings you have to be more patient and all because that's how it Mm -hmm. is i don't know if it's just my family or um it applies to 
people with like Cantonese or Chinese backgrounds, because like um, it seems like from what you described, that expectation on you know Ate and Kuya applies to almost all of the families, or at least is a very prominent expectation among a lot of like Filipino families. But I remember when it comes to like maybe Cantonese or Chinese family dynamics, I don't remember that being a very prominent theme. But for every family, there will always be. One sibling or a couple of siblings, and um, whether or not they are younger or older, they are branded as the responsible ones, and um, they will always be the responsible ones, whether or not they are older or younger. So this might be what's different um, when it comes mm-hmm. to like Cantonese or Chinese family dynamics, but I'm not really sure this is true for all Chinese or Cantonese families. So for our listeners, if you're listening to this and if you know of Chinese Cantonese culture. Let us know if this is true. Yeah. But um, going back to the family dynamics, I'm curious about for your family. I think we haven't touched upon that. Um, like, how many siblings do you have, and um, what's the normal dynamics between the siblings? Do you all have just very drastically different personalities? Who's the leader? What's the daily interaction like? Yeah. Okay. So um, I I have two other siblings. Um, I have a sister and a brother. So age difference. I'm three years older than my second sister, than my sister, and then seven years older than the youngest. In terms of dynamics, I could say, or at least what I hear from other people, that I'm the responsible one. And then my sec, the, the second one, the middle child, is tagged to have the middle child syndrome. Oops. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> sister, you so can stop she's... listening now. <laughs> so my sister, she knows, she knows. She's the more, not really liberated, but she's the not joyful also. She's just more extroverted than me. And then the youngest, well... He's the spoiled one because like, really, we would always tell this to him because growing up, so we're just starting as a family as well, right? So we don't really have much. And so eventually, of course, my parents, was they were able to make it, they were able to earn more money, they were able to get a car. And so the youngest, uh, he doesn't know how to use public transportation because he would always have a car with he would always ask me, Ate, I want to go to this place. Can you drive me? And I'm going to be like, why? You should know how to ride a jeepney or a bus or a train. Because <laughs> that's how we are when we were younger. And so in a way, that has been the rule. And being the eldest as well, I was able to really enforce that to my parents. Because I had to tell my parents that he cannot grow up um, not knowing how to do public transportation. Th- that's mm. a no-no. Like, and then I had to explain my point to my parents, and then eventually they agreed. But that's also because my dad doesn't like driving, <laughs> and I don't want to drive my brother, <laughs> so he doesn't have a choice. <laughs> so you are kind but, of the driver in the family. I used to be, yes, for like the longest time until finally my second sister was able to learn how to drive. But then again, I still try to enforce that rule that I know things are way better now than how it was back then. Because um, there was one instance when my brother would would be late. Uh, he would come home late and he was asking if we could pick him up. And mm. so... and. When I say like late, probably like around 11 at night, and I still have work the next day. And he doesn't have class, I think. So I told him, maybe you can just try to do public transportation because wherever you are, it's actually safe. And then if you cannot really do the regular public transportation, you could book an Uber or a Grab because that's available now. Back then, it wasn't yet. So you really have to suffer and then go through the entire thing. But now that it's easier, and at the same time, there's also data, cell phone, so you can text people, you can share location and make sure that you're okay. So, like, that's a skill that I wanted him to learn. And so, Mm -hmm. eventually, my parents agreed with that. And so far, like, he's in college right now and he's actually doing okay. 
So good job, Mara. I mean, it's really amazing of you that you push the agenda for him. <laughs> I mean, I don't even want to say that's like for him to learn survival skills or <laughs> skills that are essential for surviving this you world. You better learn that. Yeah, you're in the Philippines. You, you, you're you're not in the US where everything's you know um, can you have to have a car because in here we don't mm. really have one. And yeah, that's that's all. Aside from survival skills, that helps. Uh, that's a character builder in a way because mm-hmm. it grounds a person that's what i genuinely believe in and even like even like at work so we do have um younger people that's just i can't take the public transportation it's too hassle <laughs> it's too hot you know i i'll probably just ask my dad to drive me to the office or um, book an uber or something and I'm like, well, if you can, you can just try it out just to see and test it, you know, because you'll actually see the difference between mm-hmm. a person who takes public transportation versus a person who doesn't. So oh my a God. person who takes a public transportation, they are more resilient. Wow. Oh, I, I feel like quoting you on this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. I mean, like, you are truly the big sister at home and at work, <laughs> trying to, like, build people's characters by, like, go take your public transportation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to mm-hmm. make you feel more grounded, make you more resilient. And it's amazing. And then just by listening to you talking about pushing the agenda for your brother to learn, you know, skills that are essential to survival, it makes me once again feel like I'm the firstborn who gave up because I'm super chilled um, especially these days with my siblings we normally just talk um, over messages so I think it's not mm-hmm. even a medium for me to give them maybe like life lessons or like tell them oh these are some of the philosophies in life that you have to learn I'm just so chill I was just like okay yeah whatever that happens as long as you learn how to figure it out yourself without asking people for help then I'm sure you'll be on the right track I don't know what track you're on but <laughs> it's like... I mean, that's that, that's fine too maybe the difference yeah. with us is that um, I'm living with my brother so I get to see him all the time. That's, That's why true. I get to share all of these things. Has the dynamics ever changed? Like um, as kids, have you ever been bullied by your younger siblings or did they already listen to you? And these days, um, do they also look to you as the leader, as the voice of reason? Oh my God, you know this story. <laughs> but my <laughs> sister and I were the worst enemy. And my parents know this as well. So... Uh, in terms of being the leader when we were younger i don't think my sister really sees me as like one she would call me ate just for the sake of the label but i mean we're all we're always we're always just fighting to the point so she would be that she'll be sassy sassy and you're like ate. <laughs> y- yes 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 exactly <laughs> and then there's like that eye roll ate. <laughs> you know like that and my parents would be so tired of us, you know, just shouting at each other, sometimes pulling each other's hair to the point that, you know, the, my, my dad gave us knives. You know, you can't stop fighting. Just go kill Real yourself. Knives. <laughs> Real knives. How old were we? I think we were like, I'm probably, I think, eight or nine years old. So my sister is what five or six i think oh my god yes and so your dad I... asks you guys to fight it out with real knives yes <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and of course i i do have an awareness already i kind of know like what's going on but my sister kind of poked me with a knife and then eventually oh, my no. dad realized like oh shit, wrong parenting <laughs> wrong <laughs> someone can die <laughs> because a child was harmed (laughs) during the process exactly (laughs) and so of course he had to remove all the knives and then when we started fighting again let's try again this time but i'll give you boxing gloves (laughs) Mm -hmm. like legit real boxing gloves and here uh my dad is like a fan of um, boxing i mean the philippines is known for boxing so we Mm. would have these regular 
sparring sessions with my dad. Like he literally teaches us how to punch someone. Yes, wow. he is. He is very particular in terms of self defense. So like mm-hmm. we do know how to defend ourselves, and well, my sister knows how to punch, and I know what's going on. <laughs> so this time around, she kind of did punch me, and so uh, like that's the dynamics in our family. But eventually, we then realize, you know, that uh, it's also part of growing up, especially since we are both our age gap is not that far. But um, mm-hmm. I do remember there's. She told me this. Uh, we go to the same school, and then she would be labeled as Mara's sister. Mm. So she doesn't have her own identity, and I actually felt bad because. Um, well, of course, I came in first, and then everyone knows me, and I do have this personality where I would always be attending a lot of events or different kinds of um, contests. So, like, everyone knows me. And then eventually when my sister came in, she's labeled as my sister. So she had to create her own identity. And I honestly don't know, like, how it is for her. But I do think that eventually she was able to make a name for her own. I can imagine being so close in age. People will still compare. They will always be like, oh, who's the prettier one? Or like, oh, are oh, yes. you... It's like, are you the prettier version of Mara or the louder version of um, Mm -hmm. your sister or something like that, right? Like, they will always give you these kinds of labels. Yeah, there's always comparison. But then again, because we look so much alike. Mm. Sometimes we would just tell people that we're twins. (laughs) Yes. That's not a bad idea. (laughs) (laughs) Even Even until now, like, people think that we're twins. Yes. Wow. So, wow. funny story. Uh, I do have this gas card with me. So, and then here in the Philippines, we have like gas boys who would fill up our tanks, right? And then they already know me. So, there was one time that the, the gas boy saw the both of us. And then he got confused and they were like, You guys are twins? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Wow. So eventually, my sister was really able to use my gas card, and then she would also carry my ID, and then no one would question her because we kind of look alike. Wow, that's convenient. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I know you talked a little bit about your parents definitely had expectations on you um, growing up, but um, mm-hmm. compared to your other siblings, do you feel like you had a tougher time as the firstborn? Definitely, definitely. Because uh, going back to what I said a while ago, when we were younger, when I was younger, when we were just starting up, um, it is really difficult for us financially as well. So I would remember my mom asking me if she could, there were things that I, that I wanted and then she can't buy it yet. So I need to understand the situation. Mm. And then at the same time, I would also compare in terms of like age. Why is it when I was in that age, I never got that? But why is it with her right now, she gets it? Why is her allowance way bigger than mine? (laughs) Like those little things. I I see it, but at the same time, I understand it. But I still feel something, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, like, My dad's always not around. So in a way, I had to be with my mom, you know, parent beside her. There were like a lot of things that, say, my brother, taking care of my brother when he was younger. There were like dad duties that my dad wasn't able to fulfill. So Mm -hmm. I would step up and do that. Like, I don't know if this is like something that you could uh, share, but we you know, circumcision here in the Philippines. So mm. that's something that boys, they do it with their dads, but my dad's not around. So I would do it with my brother. So, like that younger, that, that sister who's, I, how old was I back then? I think I was in early high school. And then he was probably like seven or eight. And I would accompany him. And then even the small responsibilities, making sure when everyone would go to sleep, I have to make sure that all the locks are locked. I have to go around the house because, you know, I want to make sure that the family is safe. Right? 
So I would just circle around the house. And like, I was able to carry that even up until now. So I don't know if you noticed also when you guys went here at home that my my room is actually positioned in front of the street. So that, yes, so that I know what's going on if there's someone who would pass by. So if wow. they're not around, yes. And I'm on the second floor so that I do have like a bird's eye view of everything. <gasps> Wow, it's just like you're wearing so many hats for your family. You're also the security guards of the family. Oh my god. That's kind and... of like how it was instilled with me even especially when my dad would leave. He would tell me, "Okay, don't forget to do this and that and that." Yada yada yada. And so like, "Okay, sure." And compared to your siblings, they definitely don't get that kinds of conversations or like instructions from the parents, right? Like the parents, your parents wouldn't go up to them and be like, don't forget to do this. Eventually, they were they had that conversation, just mm. so we could probably like spread the responsibility or just to make them aware. But the pressure is definitely on me. I mean, it's so true when you mentioned you know growing up as the firstborn, we are always expected to be the ones who understand what's going on in the family. I definitely hear you on like your father not being around for his job and you had to like share quite a lot of parenting responsibilities with your mom because your mom would expect you to understand that, you know, like Mara, like dad's not around. So things could be tough um, for your mom. So you are expected to share the load. I can definitely resonate with that quite a lot, you know, mm -hmm. like growing up because um, uh, my parents separated when I was maybe around 11. It, it wasn't easy for my mom to look after three children, right? I mean, if I haven't mm. mentioned already, I have two younger sisters. They are twins and um, they are six years younger than me. So I think at the time that of my parents' separation, they were only, what, like five years old? <laughs> they didn't understand what's going on. And I remember maybe feeling a bit like... When you think about being 11 year old, um, it's actually not that old. Yes, um, yes. You, you, you are very still, young. <laughs> that's very, that's yeah. a very young age. Yeah, I still remember that particular moment. It's like, oh, okay. Like the situation at home changed. So now mm -hmm. I have to be um, the strong one to protect my family or whatever that is mm -hmm. like um mm -hmm. i mean I, I remember having this thought and i also remember maybe having to shield my younger siblings from what's going on so i think for the longest time i thought like by not talking to them about what's happening at home it would be fine they would have no idea but then obviously it's just mm -hmm. like now that you are older you know that it's just it's just like they, they are also little humans they could sense what's going right. on so yes i'm actually so curious to know like how that specific period of time when you know the family situation changed how that impacted them because I never had that conversation with them but then yeah I'm um, definitely going back um to the point of like oh we are always expected to be the ones understanding I, I look back on that I do feel a bit of that like my mom would really expect me to think like an adult I mean when you mentioned that it reminds me of that feeling that I felt at that particular yeah. moment has there ever been a point where you felt like, oh, as a firstborn, you know, everything is getting a bit like too heavy, too much for you? Have you ever had that talk like with your parents about like how you truly feel? Um, is there something that you truly want that's um, not really within the expectations? Okay, so uh, when my mom retired, uh, we had that talk because my mom's technically the breadwinner of the family. So in terms of expenses, it's usually my mom would pay for everything. My dad would probably like pay for uh, maybe mortgage or car, those things. But, you know, groceries, tuition fee and all, those are all my mom's. And so when she retired and my younger brother was still studying, I had to ask the question, like, what's going to happen? you're we're gonna lose like our main source of income and i think i was 25 back then so and then she said that okay i have a plan and i do like control over things i guess that's how i was raised that's how we were raised so i had to ask the follow-up question what's the plan what kind of plan is it like long-term wise and all right 
and she was able to lay out the plan and it seems doable it's sound but things happened after within like out of our control and so i had to step in then little by little um my contribution started getting bigger to the point where it's eating like more than half of whatever i'm earning and then i started asking wait why do i feel like i already have this risk why do i feel like i'm the breadwinner of this family right mm. and then i tried to ask also my siblings my sister because she's already working but during this specific moment she can't shell out money yet because she's also um, trying to pay for something else but uh, growing up you were raised to be the, the responsible one or to be the more understanding one so when there are certain times when there's a need uh, when you need to pay for something but you know you can't afford it but also at the same time you know you could probably like find a way to afford it or to pay for it or get a loan or something you would do that right like no questions asked it's your parent hat mm -hmm. working like there are there are like certain situations where my mom would ask me for money and then i know that i can't afford it but i was like wait hold on i think i could get a loan somewhere else and then i'll just figure it out how to pay for that loan she she, she never knew about the loan anyway <laughs> so like she she thought before that i could just afford it you no know, because Sometimes when you make thing when you make things look easy, you tend to get abused, for lack mm -hmm. of a better term. Yeah, but then eventually I had to tell them that because it's weighing me down already. And then when I look at the other people around me, they were doing so much things, and I feel like I could do so much also. But it's just that this responsibility is there. So I I had a sit down talk with them. Really, I had to enforce that conversation. Like, I want to. I want to leave the nest. Basically, that's what mm. I said, right? I I want to build my life. I want to go on adventure or something else. But I know the, the our current situation. I know that uh, the youngest brother is still studying. I know all the payments that we have to make so how do we make ends meet i i actually went into the details and started asking like how much is your pension gonna be like those yeah. things yes i had okay so if we break this down and that this and this like how much um will we end up with okay if i give this certain amount right like all those details to the point also like how much will my dad get after he retires where do we invest it like, what's the percentage of the interest, you know, that we have to consider in order to grow that money, all these things. So, and that conversation did not just happen once. That's like a mm -hmm. series of conversations. Because I don't know with other cultures, but there's this, um, there's this idea where the kids are the retirement plan. And I honestly hate that. So I, I told them that, like, I don't want to be your retirement plan. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like during that time when I told them, they were probably hurt because I saw the reaction of my mom. Mm -hmm. And then, but I had to say it because there's like a lot of things that's happening around us that merits that conversation. Even like, my mom's brother got sick and he has nothing basically so all the siblings are trying to pitch in and i asked my mom like if you ever get sick what's the plan you know where are we gonna get money this and that also then there was a time when she got mad and then she told me like don't worry i'm not gonna make you my retirement plan so wow. <laughs> but wow. i think this conversation has to happen it's not that you don't want to share but you also have to make them understand that you want to live your life right and yeah 
I had these conversations with a lot of my friends with kids. Like, because I try to put myself in their situation when they were younger. And I think how they approach things. I'm going to give my best to my kids, right? Whatever I'm earning, I'm going to give it to them and okay, hope that they become a better person. Then eventually, this, oh, this is the bad part. Eventually, when they grow up and they get a job, they could take care of me. Mm-hmm. And so, um, in my head, you also have to have a plan to take care of yourself when you're older, right? Because, like, let's use the analogy of birds. They try to teach their kids to leave the nest because that's how it's going to be. Hence the term empty nesters for the parents Mm -hmm. because they have to allow their kids to live their life. The kids can't be there all the time taking care of them because they are their their people too, right? So, yeah, uh, going back, I had that conversation. I had to lay out the plans because I'm already 30 and I've been living (laughs) here with my family. It's not that um, it's bad. I'm able to save up a little as well. But it's just that I have to make them responsible too. Mm -hmm. They cannot rely on me. So Mm -hmm. we might be living comfortably right now because I'm able to provide. But that doesn't mean that I'm not compromising any things within me. Right. So if Mm -hmm. I want to do me, then there is some things that is going to get compromised within their end so if it means you know not going out all the time then so be it right it's okay but it is what it is they have to accept that right and then maybe eventually if i'm able to earn like so much then sure i could give a better share but right now you know i also have to attend to myself these things you know it's so interconnected that it spills over to work, spills over to relationships, spills over to friendships. I mean, what you just described there, I feel like it's the psychological journey that's shared by a lot of firstborn children, despite maybe circumstances could be different. I guess maybe it could suck even more for those who grew up in an Asian family, because um, in terms of Asian family values, codependence is a very prominent theme. Mm -hmm. Like you can't be preaching the idea of like, um, when I grow up, when I make enough money, I'm going to like say goodbye. I'm going to leave. I'm going to like go off and live my own life. This is not something that exists (laughs) in any Asian family values at all. And you know, for our generations, right? Um, kind of like the newer generations of Asians, we're looking to kind of find that balance between yes. maybe maintaining still that um, traditional Asian family values. But at the same time, we know what's out there. We start having that sense of self, right? Mm-hmm. Like we want to be able to live a life that maybe our parents weren't able to. I mean, it's not like it's our parents' fault for not being able to live their own lives. But um, it was just the circumstances or back then times were different for them as well. Um, But just because they went through that, I think there's also a bit of that like whole education process um, on the parents' part to understand that they shouldn't expect their children to go through what they went through because times are really different. And if we have to go through what they went through, it would mean we might be in some really unfortunate situations or we haven't really made a good living ourselves. So it's it's a cycle that's not going to get broken. Exactly. And so I, I felt so much for you in terms of like having to have um, that same difficult conversation over and over again and it's just like it's always the first time when you start having that difficult conversation as the firstborn with your parents it's almost certain that they would not react well like they would Mm -hmm. either Mm -hmm. get so angry it's like how dare you saying things like this you know I sacrifice this and that to raise you blah 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 
But it's like what you're saying to them is not really something that's so wrong. It's not even like, uh, mom, I don't care about you anymore. I'm going to leave you. Like, bye. You're not even telling your parents that. It's just like, like, mom, I would like to experience what life has to offer. But then even <laughs> this sentence, before you even wrap it up, <laughs> they get so angry. And then you always yes. have to find like a different time or like, mm -hmm get creative with um, like finding a different way to tell them the same message, right? <laughs> Definitely, yes. And this didn't just happen like in one year. This takes years, right? Yeah. You try to build up that topic as well. Sometimes you reference back to a certain situation, but you've seen their reaction before. So you try to approach it differently as like what you said, you know, creatively, right? Sometimes you, you use it as a joke as an opener mm -hmm. just to have that conversation but one common thing is they try to be very defensive they are defensive defensive and dismissive because yeah. they also don't know how to approach the situation probably they don't know the answer to that because th that's what i got from my dad but i had to really squeeze out like because squeeze out the answer whatever mm -hmm. he's thinking Right. If if you're against it, then I understand that. But you gotta tell me. You you can't be dismissive all the time. I really like how you kind of took matters into your own hands in the sense of like you kind of started wearing that like financial advisor and accountant hat for the family. And then, you know, like there's there's only so much that you could do by just talking about responsibilities, duties, and feelings at some point. If um, let's say the family has to figure out mortgage or like has to figure out a bigger financial problem, then you can't just be talking about like how you feel, how I feel, what you feel, who should be responsible. You should really just look into the figures, like how much is everyone making? Um, mm -hmm. And then looking at the numbers as a family rather than having that unreasonable expectation and be like, oh, you are the leader you should take care of it all so i i really like that you're really taking the very pragmatic approach being like okay let's talk numbers let's not talk about feelings right now yes yeah numbers don't lie <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> but i mean obviously it was a long process for you to even get the message across to your parents i'm not even sure if you are at the stage where they start to understand yet but do you think over time they have maybe softened the stance a little bit how are things right now and how do you think you achieved that they're definitely more open in fact i'm actually proud of our dynamics because there are some family who really cannot not really answer back but who cannot have these open conversations with their parents, with their family members, but we have that one. Um, so they do listen now versus before. And I think that they also try to make more effort to understand where we're coming from. Because I would often hear my dad tell me that, Okay, I'm trying to understand your generation versus our generation. <laughs> so that's a step. It's actually very good. And I just have to explain it to him even more and stop telling him to use TikTok as, you know, as news source. <laughs> because he would always say, okay, I saw that your generation does this and that. Then where did you see it from TikTok? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find a more credible source. <laughs> but yes. even like even that one, you know, because they don't know any better back then. It's also us trying to parent our parent. Because mm. we have more resources now, right? So it's helping each other. They're teaching us and we're teaching them as well. So up to the point where, you know, even voting, politics, we're able to discuss that and share our thoughts and then they're more open to listening to the facts that we have to present so like it i think it's a very healthy dynamics that's good to see at least there's progress um because over time i've realized as firstborns while we are facing a lot of unreasonable expectations or um even pressure to be the role model right i think one positive thing out of being the firstborn is realizing that we are 
either way, we are kind of seen as the leader among mm. the pack, or we probably have a, a bit more say or a bit more power in the sense of like um, making changes. So I think one thing that I've been doing um, within my family is that I really try my best to actively challenge how people perceive the role of firstborns within my family. Because like we mentioned earlier during the conversation, we are always expected to be strong, to have everything figured out. I mean, at least it was my understanding as a kid, um, as for what an eldest sister should be doing like I should always have the answer I should always know what to do um that's the kind of expectation or pressure that I subjected myself to growing up as that, well that that's true that's true so yeah I, I, I totally agree because it's also a double-edged sword it kind of becomes like a trauma <laughs> that yeah. you have to unlearn and you have to tell yourself that it's okay if you if you don't know what you're doing it's okay exactly that you, don't, you can figure it out Honestly, I only came to this realization or I only started feeling comfortable about not knowing the answers, not knowing what's going on um, until pretty recently. I think <laughs> otherwise, for all the years, you know, like growing up, whenever there was a moment where I just had no idea about what the answer could be, what the solution could be, right? That That's when I felt really bad. I think that's the thing. We are always very solution-oriented. Before <laughs> we even finish... Um, figuring out what the problem is. Our brain is already at the point where it's like, what's the solution? What yes, are the options? Ex to exactly. solve we the have problem? plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. It's it's exactly excessive. It puts so much pressure to yourself that sometimes you're not even resting. You haven't mm -hmm. even taken the time to re realize things, understand, and even you know, this is like self love. Also, you know it. It yeah. roots back to your childhood trauma that it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay that you don't know things. And it's okay to figure it out slowly. So I think it's just like growing up as a kid. I guess my younger siblings were also sort of like maybe programmed to think that, oh, the sister is always better. The sister is always like excellent, doing well in everything. She's good at everything. But I think these days... I guess our dynamics really changed drastically. Like these days, we just act as if we are friends whenever we are texting each other, as opposed to like as kids. Um, first, I felt the pressure to be the role model. Mm -hmm. And then they were also maybe either told by family members or they also felt that themselves that they had to follow me, they had to listen to me. So there used to be this whole like very clear leader followers type of dynamics but now mm -hmm. we're just friends we're completely like the structure is flat like I would yeah. tell them that oh like um whatever upsets me I'll tell them that and even you know for moments of vulnerability where I just have no idea what to do I will now be the person to ask them what should I do I'm very glad to be able to achieve this type of dynamics with my sisters like I just feel like this kind of bond that you share with your sisters is something that you can't find anywhere else mm -hmm. with like friends from outside so I'm very glad that this is where we're at and at the same time like you know with my family with my mom right it's always a work in progress but then I think one thing that I try my very best to really educate them or like parent them about mm -hmm. is like it's okay to set clear and healthy boundaries let's say when the other person is um, being toxic or having unreasonable requests or expectations because it's not really about like how I love them or not because for Asian family members relatives or parents whenever you set boundaries or whenever you try to keep a bit of distance that's when they will guilt trip you by saying like oh aren't we family you don't love me anymore <laughs> you, don't res you don't respect me the, the, the respect <laughs> is always there exactly but then when you start telling them like the respect has to be mutual if you don't respect me i'm not going to respect you and then that's was like who taught you that you know where did yeah, you learn that's this from? wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it was really a struggle but at one point despite you know, nothing completely dramatic or, or bad or like not really like any bad shit that went down. But then I just felt like, okay, this whole like Asian family dynamics felt so unhealthy to me. Like you're constantly feeling like you're indebted to, let's say, your mom, your parent. You always owe them something, right? But, but despite that, the really... gratitude. That's what exactly. they call it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And despite 
sometimes some of your requests or some of the things that you want to do are completely within reason you're not even like you're not even doing drugs like don't do drugs anyone okay like don't do crimes don't do bad shit <laughs> but then sometimes it makes you feel like I just want to go on a trip. Um, I'm not even looking to do bad stuff. Like, why do I need to ask for permission? So at some point, I have kind of declared this like really clear boundaries. Like, you know what? If I'm going to do things within reason, I'm not going to ask for permission because at the end of the day, I'm the person paying for it. Like, if I'm going to move somewhere, I'm not going to like ask for permission whether or not I can or should move. Like, I'll just do like what I think makes sense for my life at that particular moment. And if they have any negative things to say that are completely unreasonable then that's when I will like set the boundaries even clearer by limiting or even cutting off access to me so they will know that whoa like she's ignoring us or like whoa I can't text her well she's not picking up the cause and then in a way just like over time you send that message it's like okay if they are not being supportive or if they are being like toxic for the sake of being toxic then they lose access to you so that's what i've been doing and i think so far some of my relatives or my family members do get the message and i guess we are kind of at the stage where we are sort of exploring you know where the lines are and let's not cross them i i love that i love that it takes so much courage to be able to draw that boundary i swear because i i've been talking about it with my therapist you know trying mm -hmm. to draw that line and it's hard because you grew up in this system where it's ingrained within you so you're trying to unlearn things that makes up who you are as a person Right, so yeah. saying no to your family, right? It's it's, it's hard. <laughs> it, it is, it is like totally saying no or even not now, like those things. It's it's still hard, and like what you did, you know, standing up for yourself and telling them no, right? Stop! Mm -hmm. I I'm gonna do my shit. I, I'm not asking permission. I'm probably just like saying, you know, because mm -hmm. there is difference in that. Because sometimes, well, at least for us, I would try to tell them, but they would say no. And in my head, I'm mm -hmm. not asking for permission. I'm just telling you where I'm going to be. And this is like um, the, where I'm going to be. And this is the time I'm going to get home. Right. But yeah. I'm not asking permission. Or sometimes what they would do is like what you said, guilt trip you. But you know, uh, we're going to do this and that. Are you sure that you want to go there? <gasps> <laughs> and especially, you still live in the same house with them. I feel mm -hmm. like the very thing you're not able to establish that physical boundary makes everything a lot harder. And I do think the game changer is really not living with your family. <laughs> and you can never go back Like once you do that. <laughs> That's why I was so sad when I had to go back here. When I was in the US. <laughs> that taste no, like, of freedom. <laughs> for real. Because there was a time um, prior pandemic when I was living on my own. So I rented mm. um, a place literally nearby my office. And I haven't told my parents about this. But it's like one of the best times of my life. Because I have the freedom to do everything. And at the same time, you don't have to deal with all the emotional things at home. Because yeah. seeing your current situation at home, even though it's not bad, sometimes it can get stressful and it affects your it affects your overall mental being, right? You know, yeah, because uh, you're in it, you're energy. living in exactly. it. Yeah. Exactly, but when you're able to separate yourself from that one, or even just hearing it after the fact, that's already a huge relief versus just being there. So it really is like so true to move out, figure things on your own. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's okay if you want to go back, right? At least you're able to experience that. But if uh, moving out and living on your own works for you, then why not? Because I honestly want to do that. <laughs> Obviously, I understand it's a privilege, um, like being able to live on our own away from family. Like you can only do so when you can afford to do so. And um, also, I think 
why it's a game changer because when your parent or for example for my mom when she knows exactly what it's like when she doesn't have access or easy access to her child anymore and any time or every time that you visit her or like when you get to see her she will be extra nice because mm. you know like when you don't see each other every day <laughs> you will cherish each other's presence even more right yes yes <laughs> that that's true that's true before we quickly go into some of the maybe practical tips as for you know um based on our learnings or maybe our experience with therapists so far to take care of ourselves as firstborns i'm just wondering like you mentioned earlier a very strong point like that whole firstborn hat could spill over to other aspects in life for example friendship workplace relationships i'm wondering if there are any aspects in your life or any particular examples that you felt this the, the most? Oh yeah, like those three things. So maybe I can start first with friendship. So within my group of friends, I'm called the mommy. What? So, like, <laughs> yes, yes. So you you met my best friend when we were there in the US and I don't know if you probably like heard her call me mommy, but that's what she calls me. Yes, everyone knows you that. you pack like, I'm... lunch, you drive. <laughs> I do. I, I pack lunch, I drive. Like, I do all the lists. I make sure that everyone's prepared. All the... I was the mother in the group. So that's Did you, like, so figure well. out all the reservations, uh, bookings, oh, yes. blah, blah, blah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Wow. E e everything, right? I, I remind them of things as well. And because that's your personality. That's how you were built. I just need to pause for a moment and just remind everyone how incredible of a human being Mara is. Like she <laughs> is the big sister for everyone within the family, with friends and probably at work as well. She takes care of everyone. And oh my God, it's so tiring to be you. And yet you make it look easy. I know it's not easy. It's not, it's not. But I mean, I guess it's a part of who we are. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it can be bad as well. Because like, so that's for friendship but then say for work i have this sense of maturity and my boss would always tell me this so i was able to use this for like the better i was able i was promoted in such a young age so and they would compare me with the other people within the same age as me and they would ask like why is it that you're this and they're not so i don't want to get compared to other people because they are their own individuals but it's just that it's also seen in the workplace and sometimes too you gotta live on to that expectations so you have your expectations for yourself and then you kind of made this expectations and you, you made this image and so they have expectations towards you as well and you might have to make sure that you fulfill it so there's that as well and then like yeah. as for your relationship well i a lot of my friends know this, but I tend to be the more dominant one. Mm. So sometimes when you're too dominant, also you want to control things to the point where you're also controlling your partner and you become a mother to your partner and your partner is not really looking for a mom. He's looking for a partner. So that's when it gets really crazy, right? So yeah, it's, it's not good, honestly, right? You guess. Yeah. You got to learn how to depend on your partner and not take things in your own hands. And if it's something that's within you, then again, it's really unlearning things and trusting also people that they got you. You don't just got yeah. this, right? So it's something that I have to learn and I'm still learning, right? Because there's this term. So there's an alpha female, but at the same time, there's like a stigma, like a, a stigma type of person where you you do have that alpha energy, but you're more emotionally matured. Yes, you, mm. you do understand things more and you know when to step down and let your partner do his thing and lead the relationship. That's so true. I, I think that whole very action of 
letting go of control is something that we always have to remind ourselves in all aspects in life because we just aren't programmed to be chilled. I mean, let's face it, like mm-hmm. we just want to control everything, like either in friendship, in the workplace and relationships. But then I think over time, we realize if we want to control every tiny aspect in life, it could be very tiring and we can get mm-hmm. burnt out so easily. I think for some reason, I'm always friends with type B people, like people who are Mm. super chilled. And from my perspective, I would always be like, why are you like that? Why can't you get your shite together? Like, I mean, we're just trying to schedule a dinner. Why can't you just tell me like when works and where works? And we we fix a date, we fix a time, we make the reservation and then we'll make that happen. But then for some reason, my friends... That's that's exactly like me. (laughs) For some reason, some of my friends will always be so chill. It's like, ah, we'll figure it out. I was like, so are we meeting on that day yeah. and that particular time? And then they're like, ah, let's see how we feel. I'm like, no, not no. how we feel. <laughs> like, it's either, <laughs> it's either happening. Like, we, we either confirm now or it's no. not I happening. I need an answer. <laughs> yes or no. <laughs> exactly. So over time, I realized. I mean, there's no right or wrong. It's not like our friends who take this chilled approach is hopeless or like it's the wrong way to approach things. It's just how they do things. So I guess these days I go, like, yeah, I guess I could do with that whole like going with the flow thing. Despite, But that's hard. But that's so hard. It's hard. Like you have to remind yourself always like, ah, at this particular moment, it will be good for me to let go of the control. Okay, three, two, one. Let me let go of that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You, ha- you have to control that time when you're going to lose control. <laughs> Whether it's in friendship, at work, or in relationships, sometimes you also have to remind yourself that I don't always have to be the person to be doing that. I don't uh-huh. always have to be helpful because if you're helpful in any tiny micro task or micro aspect let's say at work or whatever that is or if you have line managers yeah you you don't want to micromanage how they do things because when you stop micromanaging people they become 10 or 100 times smarter because they are seen as an actual functioning human being. They feel empowered that they can make decisions, right? But then I think for like firstborns or type A people or managers, it will be kind of hard for them to just like, oh, I can't trust this person to be doing this. But then you always have like, yeah, okay, um, trust that person. They are fine, no matter how they figure out doing that. And also it's essential for you to let go of the control. Otherwise you will just be doing their tasks for them and it makes you busier so true so true (laughs) that's when i also learned the difference between being responsible and being a leader because leader doesn't always mean that you have to be responsible for everything right that's when you also know how to delegate tasks and manage people right you don't have to do everything on your own you got to make them responsible Mm -hmm. too so like these things that you have to learn as you grow up and you you try to separate who you are as a firstborn and who you are maybe eventually if you become a leader in your own field yeah and i i do see that very trait of um firstborns or let's say type a people they can easily be taken advantage of wherever they are in life because we always the people who just can't stand going through any downtime. Like we just want the solution like right here, right now. And if no one is solving that problem, then I am going to do that. But then yes. we need to kind of unlearn that because we can't solve all the problems in the world. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So but true. um, before we move on to the next segment, I just want to quickly touch on any practical tips that we can maybe leave our listeners with to share with um some of the first borns to in terms of maintaining um their mental health maybe i'll quickly start first i mean i think we we talked about that which is um you don't always have to have everything figured out and it's okay to not know the answer at any particular moment it's okay to ask for help um Mm -hmm. when you just can't figure out a problem yourself and i think we have to practice saying i don't know I don't know the answer. And I guess the other very important point I would like to bring up is also a long time ago, I learned this from a therapist friend of mine. 
it was a long, long time ago, and I was still at the stage where I felt like, you know, as the firstborn, as a responsible daughter, um, I'm not supposed to get angry at my mom or at any people who are、mm. in my family. Right? When I said that, my friend just said, "Why can't you be angry at them?" And then that was kind of like a eureka moment for me. It's like, oh, that's right. Why can't I be angry at my mom? What's stopping me from showing anger to my mom? Like we are just equals. We are human beings. We feel emotions. We should be able to show our emotions. Like, why is it that just because she's my mom, I can't show how I truly feel, being conscious of her feelings, right? And so from that. Point onwards, I guess maybe I started this whole like self care journey. Like I started learning the concept of what taking care of myself really means.、Mm-hmm. It's to really acknowledge and validate my feelings, and not tell myself that I'm not supposed to feel a certain way in any situation. Hmm. 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 That's so true. <laughs> I would like to actually piggyback on that one because you know it's okay. To feel mad, it's okay to feel upset because those are emotions. You can actually stop yourself from feeling the way you want to feel. Because if you try to stop yourself, that's gonna burst eventually, right? And that's gonna do more harm than good. So with that, also you have to have, I guess, those conversations with your parents. Not because they're your parents doesn't mean you can't have those open conversations. Because I've seen this with a lot of people, like. I would ask them, "Why don't you just talk to your mom?" And then they're gonna be like, "I can't. Why? Because I can't. Why? They're not gonna、mm-hmm. listen. So make them listen, but they they won't. It takes time, and it takes patience as well. You have to be patient, right? Just as how they were patient with us when they were trying to raise us, we also have to be patient with them when we're trying to raise them." <laughs> That's true. To, That's yeah.、So、true. Yeah. That there's also kind of like a whole process of figuring out which communication method or medium works、mm-hmm. best for them as well. Because I think for myself, when I try to do face to face conversations,、um, for some reason my mom tends to overreact. But then when it's delivered over text message, because you have time to think through how to present the message, how to deliver that, how you word that, right? And they also have time to read that. And read that again and digest、mm-hmm. within themselves. I think you just have to figure out if face to face doesn't work, right? Then why don't、right. you try writing a letter? Why don't you try、mm-hmm. text messaging? Or if you like, you can record a video message, even. So true, but at the same time, like also don't give up on them that easily. Because、mm-hmm. there were also some people who would. I I don't know if that's the Asian in me saying this, but. At the end of the, or probably the firstborn in me, right? Because I just care too much, but they just didn't know any better when they were younger.、Mm. So we also have to understand that they were raised probably the way how they or their parents know how to raise them, and so we need to be patient with them. We have to tell them how we feel, and we also might want to ask them how they feel as well. Because most、yeah. often than not, they don't know how to express their emotions. Yeah, no one ever asked them how they felt, right?、Mm-hmm. They they are not、Probably. even familiar with like, oh, like I'm allowed to talk about how I feel, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, true. Because they they just kept on hustling, right? They have to provide、yeah. for their kids. They have to make money. So there was there was no room for their emotions back then. Probably. So if we can create this space, then. Maybe we could create like healthier relationships. That's true. That's true. And、um, like we mentioned earlier, draw healthy boundaries because you can't、mm-hmm. make these healthy changes when you are not healthy mentally、yes. or physically. And now it's time for us to move on to the next segment, which is called Rapid Fires. <laughs> And in this segment, I'll be asking my guests biased questions they've got asked at some points in life. And for this episode, misconceptions and assumptions people have about firstborn children, which we talked a little bit about earlier. But Mara, are you ready to address some of these misconceptions? Let's go! All right. 
first one. Firstborns have it all figured out and are always the responsible one. No. <laughs> I guess we no. we spent the past hour answering this. The answer is no. We don't. We don't no. know shit most of the time. Everyone. We make it look like we know, but we don't. <laughs> exactly. Second misconception. Firstborns should be the one financially supporting the family. Nah. -uh. No. <laughs> no. No. Who? Oh. It, it can be a team effort. And the third one. Firstborns are always the smallest height-wise. <laughs> I think Is so. Is it true? I don't, I don't know. I've seen a lot of people who are like that. We can ask the are audience you, maybe. Are you the I'm smallest? the smallest. Yes. Ah, actually, are you? I'm still the tallest. I'm still oh. the tallest among three siblings. Despite the height difference is not a lot. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. We can we can ask God this. Let's yeah. see how it is for them. Let us know. Let us know. Um, the next one. Firstborns have the most photos. <laughs> Very timely. I asked this to one of my mommy friends, mm -hmm. and she said that since she's so she's excited to have that firstborn, so every moment of every day she takes a lot of photos. And I felt like it's kind of true with me as well because amongst all my siblings, I have the thickest albums. I have like monthly photos, evolution of Mara versus that versus like the youngest. He 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 doesn't have that monthly, weekly photos since I was like <laughs> he was born, but I have that. Interesting. Wow. Wow, I guess that's one benefit of being a firstborn. Like, you have the thickest albums, and then when it goes to the youngest, he just has one page <laughs> because yeah. the parents are like, it, it takes too much work taking photos. Let, let's uh, <laughs> sit this it's one just out. The same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, next one firstborns are bossy. Might be. I have heard a lot of that. They tell me that I tend to be bossy, even at work, even how I project myself. So, might be. I guess the other way to look at it is we're just so solution driven that we are always trying to find an answer when no one has the answer. So, this is why it makes us appearing to be a bit bossy because we are always like, okay, I have so many problems that I need to solve. I have no time to waste. Let's just get yeah. this, you know, out of the way. <laughs> right, right. So maybe that's you also why. have to establish things. That's why you tend to be assertive. Maybe not bossy, but you tend to be yeah. more assertive in things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at least for myself, it's just like, I'm always thinking I have no time to waste. Let's figure mm -hmm. this one out so I can move on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> True. Mm -hmm. And the last one, firstborns are more easygoing. This is the the complete opposite. <laughs> are they? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Because we need to figure things out. We need to have a plan. So I don't think that counts as easygoing. Yeah, I think with any firstborns that I I have dealt with, they always have this energy of stress they're always stressed out they're always like a bit paranoid so i guess <laughs> it wouldn't really be like easy going <laughs> i don't know if it's true like for our listeners are the chilled people that you have dealt with usually the younger siblings <laughs> let us know <laughs> or maybe they are i don't know but if they are then maybe can you tell us the secret how to be yeah. the firstborn and just be chill I know, maybe um, they subscribed to the philosophy of Buddhism or... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, that wraps up our segment of Rapid Bias. <laughs> and for us to close out the episode, um, we touched a lot on different aspects of being firstborns, but um, Mara, do you have any like final parting words, nuggets of wisdom, or just any message that you think firstborns would like the world to know? Mm. Maybe one one statement. You're doing good. You're actually doing great for all the firstborns. It's okay if you don't if you don't know what, if you can't figure things out, but you're okay. You're doing great. And finally, what does it mean to be proudly 
Filipino to you, Mara? So I guess being Filipino, proudly Filipino, the concept of family. Because despite everything else, you know, we always try to make sure that our family is taken care of. We love each other. And that's something within me. I think that's truly Filipino, if not actually proudly Asian as well. But it is the concept of family and being able to provide for everyone, while at the same time making sure that you yourself is also taken care of. That's beautiful. Mara, thank you so much for spending the time with us. And just one one more time, you're such an incredible person. So thank you so much for being you, you know, for showing up Aww. for everyone around you and also a big fat thank you to all the firstborns who are listening mm. out there you are doing great and you are enough just like what mara said <laughs> yes that's it for this episode of proudly asian don't forget to follow us on instagram at proudly.asian for more content we are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Leave us a five-star review on wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in and signing off for now. I'm Isabel Wong. This, this, this.